Welcome everyone to lab session for week three of writing Wikipedia articles. We have Christine helping out who, uh, as you may recall, was a student in our last session and has been very helpful uh, in the chat sessions and on the class talk page in helping people find their way around. So thank you very much, Christine, for helping out with that. Uh, and in addition to that, we will have a special guest today, uh, Stephen Laporte, who is a friend of mine and a longtime Wikipedian. Uh, he's also based here in the Bay Area. Uh, I believe he's going to be joining us uh, a few minutes after the hour. Uh, but he has uh, agreed to, to join in and talk a little bit about his experience editing Wikipedia. Uh, we're going to have a, a panel discussion in our next class session of Wikipedians, and Stephen may be joining us for that as well. Um, but this will be sort of a preview of the kind of, uh, the kind of session that we'll have for that. So um, with all of that said, uh, we had a pretty uh, a pretty busy class session on Tuesday. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, and um, if you if, if you've seen the email that we sent out today, uh, we added a lot of information on our Wikipedia pages as well. So uh, I'm I'm hoping that you have all had the chance to pick a Wikipedia article to focus on for your final project for the class. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, I'd love to talk with you during this session about that, uh, or if you've picked your art article and you're uh, running into some questions or have some ideas to bounce around about how you're going to approach it, uh, that's a great thing to discuss in this session as well. So uh, is there anyone who can tell us what article they've chosen? Uh, feel free, as always, especially in the lab sessions, to uh, click on the talk button and just use your microphone, or if you prefer to uh, punch your ideas into the chat window, that's fine too. So, okay, Jeanette, you've chosen open educational practices. So uh, let's. I'm I'm going to just start right off. Uh, I'm going to pull that up in the uh, in the web browser here. And maybe you would be willing to tell us a little bit about why you chose this article and what um, what kind of improvements you think you might like to make on it. Oh, also, we as always we have the Etherpad. Uh, I know most of you are are logged in to that, but if you're not, uh, please do. The uh, the link is right on the main class page, etherpad.wikimedia.org slash wikisu, all caps. Uh, and please feel free to take any notes here. Oh, and I see that Stephen has joined us. Welcome, Stephen. Um, and is perhaps still getting the audio set up. So. Uh, Stephen, when you uh, when you get through the audio setup wizard, why don't you um, say hello? Uh, I'm going to give you a moment to get through that. And actually, Christine, if you're able to, you should have the ability to give Stephen moderator privileges. If you could do that, so I don't have to click around while I'm talking, that would be nice. Um, and if you if you have trouble figuring that out, just let me know. Um, Anyway, so uh, Jeanette has just told us that she chose the Open Educational Practices article. Hi. Um, Hi. Can you? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Um, uh, I chose Open Educational Practices because um, I actually practice Open Educational Practices, and one of the in doing research about it, I saw that. Um, that a lot of people don't actually know how to use and reuse open educational resources, even if it's available. So I'm really interested in the fact that um, in, uh, in developing this part of open educational resources. And on the talk page, I did suggest a structure under Red Valley 14. Um, I did suggest a structure for, for it. Um, and uh, did you yeah, say so under I, Red Valley 13? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's your uh, yeah. username. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, okay. yeah, that's my username. So I suggested that, um, that so we developed the lead section and uh, then a definition section. Um, and difference from OER since that came up in the in one of the uh, in the reviews before and initiatives like what kind of programs there are and impact in those and resources. That's what I was thinking about in terms of developing it. Very good. 
Okay, and um, I see also um, on this talk page uh, uh, that V. Taylor, who I believe is also a student in our class, just did a review of the article as well. Did you um, have you looked at that? And do you do you think that you're seeing similar yeah. opportunities with the article? Yeah, I do have a question about that. Since we're not in the same group, um, how does it work if we're not in the same group? Because I thought one of the, one of the ideas behind being in a group is that we can help each other. Um, so would it be better if she, if the the other person, V. Taylor and I, were, and were in the same group? Um, how how are you going to address the question of group work uh, of work, working together as a group a little bit later? Because I think it'd be great if we were in the same well, group. Yeah, um, you know, and I think if uh, uh, I, I I think it's fine if um, if you want to reshuffle your groups a little bit. Um, I don't know how many people are active in each of your groups, so obviously, uh, it you know, you, if if there's only two or three people active in a group, it could be a little difficult to have one person leave uh, for the other members, but you could also conceivably just combine your entire groups if that was uh, if that was something that your teammates are willing to do. Um, but also apart from that, you know, really when you're working on the same article, the best place to discuss changes to it is on that article's talk page, is on this page that you've just done your reviews. So right. um, you really don't need to be in the same group, you know, just, just leaving notes like you have in your review here and then, you know, elaborating further on that as you develop the article if you come up with uh, with further questions or ideas you know this is probably the best best place to do this is sort of the most natively Wikipedian uh, place to do that so it may be that 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 just using this page is plenty for you okay okay thanks yeah and and of course you can also you can always just contact each other directly on your talk pages or uh, if you visit V Taylor's uh, user page or user talk page you should find this uh, email this user link in the left hand navigation so you would be able to um, to send him or her uh, an email and then uh, you, you won't you won't see their email address but then when they receive yours they'll see yours and you and you can carry on an email discussion that way okay so okay, that was pretty yep and and then just one final note on that the the email is it's always a very convenient option uh, but it's it's generally sort of considered best practice with Wikipedia to uh, to use the talk page and be as as public and transparent about your discussions as possible. Um, there are times when email can be useful to you know to get someone's attention if maybe they haven't logged into Wikipedia for a little while uh, or something like that. But um, you know, as as a general rule, it's better if you can uh, if you can keep those discussions on the article talk page as much as possible. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Right. Um, I guess, but before we before we let you go, uh, Jeanette, I I um I'm sorry, is it? I've I've lost track. Jeanette, uh, it's not Jeanette, is it? <laughs> I'm looking at two. It is, windows. it is. Yes, but my my username is um, Red Wally fourteen, so it it is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I was getting confused. Okay. Um, no, I'm I'm curious. You you said that you use open educational practices in your work, and I see you teach at the Cambridge School. I actually grew up a, a town over from that, uh, so it's a I know that's a, a private high school in the Boston area. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering if you could just uh, take a moment and just tell us a little bit about how you you use open education educational practices. I'm especially curious about how that goes over in a high school environment. Um, well, it's it's an alternative high school, so I have. Um, a lot of freedom. Uh, I have, I, um, I come from academia. I have my PhD, so um, I have a lot of discipline, knowledge in literature um, and writing. Um, and one of the things that I do is I actively search for OER, Open Educational Resources, online, and I repackage it for my classes. Um, and I figure out what's appropriate based on grade level. Uh, so, uh, so, so far for all of my literature and writing classes, I have incorporated some aspect of OER. Um, so I actually practice OER. And then this past year, I have I, I, um, the Jane Eyre class that I taught, I used Project Gutenberg Jane Eyre. And all of the resource material for the class 
was either through BBC or even Wikipedia. Or Wikipedia. And the next year, I'm, I'm designing a, a completely OER American literature class. So um, I've become quite um, adept at finding the material that I need and repackaging it to suit my classes. Um, both in terms of literature and and uh, writing classes. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, and I, I think uh, I, I suspect that some of your classmates here are probably interested in some of the things you talked about. So feel free to, if there are any links um, to you know the the site that you were mentioning, Project Gutenberg, anything like that uh, that you want to put in the Etherpad. Uh, Please feel okay. free, and that way people can Actually, I've, I've been having trouble wanna, with using the Etherpad on uh, uh, Firefox. It keeps on redirecting away from the Etherpad, so that's why I haven't actually um, used it as yet. I can I oh, can no. get through, I can get through to it through Chrome, but my Firefox for some reason keeps on redirecting away from it. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Stephen. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, yes. Hey, so are you familiar with oh, Wikisource? Stephen. Uh, I, I think that's for you, Jeanette. Um, I certainly am. I think Stephen knows that. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was the question? I didn't hear it. Oh, sorry. Uh, are you familiar with Wikisource? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm familiar with Wikisource. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Wikisource has a lot of material from Project Gutenberg. So if you're if you're ever interested in finding literature that needs to be proofread or uh, wiki organized, uh, Wikisource is a great project to look into. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks. I I do know about Wikisource. I I I have to say I spend probably way too much time on the internet. <laughs> uh, Stephen, I'm I'm sure there are uh, other students in the class though who have never heard of it. So do you do you want to just uh, take a moment and talk about what Wikisource is and how it might apply to education? I'm going to pull up a couple pages here while you're doing that. Sure. Ready. So Wikisource is a sister project of Wikipedia. It's a it's built on a wiki, um, and it's all openly licensed or in the public domain uh, material. So there's really old literature. There is really new things that are freely licensed, but everything there is is free and open. And uh, essentially, what it is is a, it's a platform for people to take a a book that's been scanned and then digitize it. Uh, so you can do part of that with software, but it needs to be sort of proofread to make sure the software digitized it properly. And uh, that's what the community on Wikisource does. There's a kind of parallel community with Project Gutenberg called the Distributed Proofreaders Project. Um, but yeah, Wiki, Wikisource uses wikis in order to do proofreading. And every, every month they, they do sort of a, uh, they focus on one book where everyone reads the same book and it's not, not like a book club where they talk about the book. It's they all focus on trying to get the, the digital copy proofread so that at the end there's a there's an ebook that anyone else can reuse. So uh, yeah, it's it's a fun project if you're interested in reading or you're interested in kind of making old literature accessible on uh, in, in digital formats. But uh, it's 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 a, it's a lot more kind of simple tasks than Wikipedia, where Wikipedia you have to go out and do research. On Wikisource, you just need to look at the digital copy and then um, and, and then make sure it's, it's digitized properly. And at the end, it's great that the ebook is there. Other people reuse it. And uh, yeah, it, it's fun if you just want to read stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, just, to, um, just to follow on that, uh, for a moment, the, I've, I've pulled up in the in the browser window here. Just this is the, the featured text from this month uh, on Wikisource, which is the first edition of the science fiction magazine Amazing Stories. So this is something that's old enough that it's fallen into the public domain. It's really redistributable, um, and I thought it might be of interest to just take a really quick look at the editing interface. Um, this will sort of give you an idea of how the project works. You see uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, this is the, the scan of the book. So these, these scans come often from Project Gutenberg or from other places on the internet where people have uh, taken the trouble to scan in every page of a magazine or a book. And then there, the, the Wikisource software will do a basic 
um, optical character recognition. So it will it will try to recognize all of the words uh, in that scan and then pull them in over here on the left hand side and then you have the ability but it won't be all nicely formatted like this right it won't it won't really know how to put in you know double lines and how to center things and and put in these uh, you know this nice drop cap at the beginning of the paragraph but then uh, you can go in and edit it like a wiki page much like we have on Wikipedia and you can see people have, have put in all of these codes that sort of reproduce that formatting um, and I, I wanted to also point out uh, that I've actually uh, worked on an, a, a, a book that's probably of particular interest to this class, um, which is the book A Basic Guide to Open Educational Resources. This is a couple of years old. Uh, it's by a, a guy named Neil Butcher, who is a, a leader in the OER movement. Uh, the book itself is released under a free license, which is why it's possible to be put on Wikisource, and uh, this is something that if you're working on the article about open educational resources or Jeanette on open educational practices or many uh, related articles, this is probably going to be a really good source for that. And uh, the, the fact that it's here on Wikisource should make it a little more accessible to read than just the, the PDF that you'd be able to download, download otherwise. So the way to browse through it is in this top section. Uh, you'll see these links to the table of contents. And then from here, you can click through to any one of the sections. Uh, and really, this first section, uh, basic, the, the frequently asked questions, uh, is something that, that really can, can be very useful in, um, in sourcing basic statements in things like the article on OER. So um, I'm going to just pause for a second here. Uh, I'm actually. Uh, yeah, if, if anyone else has uh, has any uh, comments or questions about the article they've chosen, uh, why don't you think about that, and I'm going to come back in just a sec. Yeah, I, I needed to um, I, to let Pete um, give Stephen uh, moderator privileges um, oh, yeah. since he's kind enough to join us today because uh, I, I found where to do it, Pete, but I don't seem to have that option. Okay, thanks, Christine. That's what I was just trying to make sense of your comment, and that's... I, I, I see that. So uh, I'm going to give it a try here. I'm not sure what's going wrong, but um, if if we can't, I don't think it's. I think it's something that we can probably just let go because um, obviously Stephen's able to talk to us, and that's the important thing. Let's see. I had a little bit of trouble when I gave you moderator privileges as well, Christine. So this is, we've just got some kind of funky software that we're dealing with, and sometimes. I just don't know how to make it work right. So yeah, I think we're gonna I think we're gonna have to skip that because it's for some reason not working for right for me either. Well, it it may be easier for um, for Stephen to focus on talking and you can do the driving for it. Yep, sounds good to me. Okay, so um, is there uh, any anyone else in class here? Is someone else? in the article they want to work on. Christine, I know you have, and uh, I'd love to hear from you about that. Um, what I, I see you've actually chosen a couple of different articles, one that you worked on in the last class session, and uh, also I think it was the article on encyclopedic knowledge. So do, do you want to maybe talk to us for a bit about what you, what you did in the past on OER and what you want to do in the future on both of these? Um, sure, I'd be glad to. Um, I, I wrote in uh, a review of the OER article that um, I, I worked on last class, which is available to anyone who's interested in that. Uh, it is on the talk page for the Open Educational Resources. And, uh, you know, coming into the class for the first time uh, during the, the last iteration, uh, I was actually not very knowledgeable about Open Educational Resources at all, so it was uh, quite, a, quite a, a big ramp uh, for for me to to ramp up, but um, it's really a very interesting area, and I have learned a lot, and um, I'm continuing to um, to think about open educational resources, and um, and uh, I've indicated a few areas that I intend to continue to contribute to this article. Um, I'm particularly interested in the the uh, the critical discussion around OER. So um, you'll, you'll see in my comments there some of my, my plans regarding that. 
Um, but then as a, sort of a, a tangent from thinking about open educational resources, um, I, I realized that um, as a philosopher, I was also interested in things uh, like epistemology or, you know, the study of how we know what we know and uh, the, the broader subject of knowledge creation and issues like the commodification of knowledge. And I, I just stumbled upon the fact that um, Wikipedia itself actually had no article on it, on the idea of encyclopedic knowledge. Um, so I, I thought I would um, get to work on that as well during this class session. And um, th that is proving to be uh, really interesting as well, because Wikipedia has uh, a, an article on encyclopedias, of course, but um, encyclopedic knowledge is more of an embodied um, uh, idea of, of a, a vast set of of uh, what we know that, that changes historically over time. And it, it seems like um, Wikipedia of all places should have an article on encyclopedic knowledge. So um, I started a stub and um, I'm working mainly in a, in a sandbox now on the article, but I'll be adding uh, another uh, version of the article hopefully uh, next week. So that's what I've been up to, Pete. Wonderful. And I think you're uh, you're you're very modest to refer to this as a stub. <laughs> this is this is a very strong start to an article. So, very cool. Oh well, thank you. And uh, just by way of methodology, something I I was um, looking for an, uh, a chance to share, which I'll take this opportunity to do, is to uh, if you if students in the class are not familiar with the piece of open source software called FreeMind. Um, F-R-E-E-M-I-N-D, I'll put a link to it um, on the Etherpad. I find that a really helpful way to organize my thoughts about um, any kind of writing that I'm doing. Um, so I have a, a, a big mind map of the encyclopedic knowledge article, um, which, is, which is how I'm um, approaching the creation of, of the content for the Wikipedia article. Excellent. Yeah, I've used this software as well. I haven't used it extensively, but that's uh, that's cool to know that it's a good uh, a good way to support writing a Wikipedia article. I hadn't really thought about it for that use. Um, so uh, just to circle back, uh, while we've been discussing this, uh, EJ had a good question in the chat window uh, and asked, "Is is something on Wikisource?" A good uh, can can that be used as a source for a Wikipedia article? Uh, Stephen's already answered this and said yes, uh, not 100% of the time, but most of the time, uh, and pointed to a, a template that you can use on Wikipedia to cite Wikisource. So I'm going to type that in here. We haven't talked a lot about templates in class, so um, uh, if you have questions about what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm going to try to describe this a little bit. Uh, the way that Stephen typed it into the chat window was just between squiggly, squiggly brackets, um, but the way I'm typing it here in the in the address window is I type the word template colon site wiki source. So template is a uh, uh, it's a namespace as we've discussed. Uh, so it's along the lines of the talk namespace or the Wikipedia namespace, but it's reserved for things that are are uh, templates are basically designed to be pulled into a Wikipedia article to provide uh, formatting or text that's commonly reused. So things like uh, the info box on the right-hand side of the page, uh, that's going to be based on a template. And this site wiki source is uh, this is going to be a template that it's 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 something that makes it easy to cite something that's on the wiki source site. So um, as you see, as as we come to this page, it has a lot of documentation on how to use it. There can be a lot to to read here, but if you, if you scroll down to this examples section, this will basically show you how to use it. In order to pull it into a page, uh, this is why Stephen put the squiggly brackets on either side. That's the way that you, uh, that you call a template within a page is just to put the squiggly brackets and then the name of it. And then when it has 
uh, parameters. Uh, so when there's specific information you want to add to it, like the title of the book, uh, that's going to come after a vertical bar. So this this uh, main documentation page is going to kind of kind of show you what the language of this particular template is. So here, this one on basic usage, this shows us um, how to use Wikisource, and you, you might recognize that this is kind of a similar format to what we've seen before in the site book and site news templates that we've used through the referencing feature. Um, so you have the first name of the author, the last name of the author, uh, the link to the author's Wikipedia article, the year of the book, the title of the book. And so when you type this into a Wikipedia article and save the page, the way that it's going to appear is like this. So it gives you the all of that information pulled into a nice clean citation format. Uh, with the links built in and things like that. And you see here is the link to the Wikisource version of the book. Um, but there's also this question, as Stephen said, it's maybe not 100% of the time that a Wikisource uh, book or magazine uh, would be usable as a source for Wikipedia. So uh, let me just address that in a little more detail. The The main uh, the main thing that's going to tell you whether something is a, a good source or not for a Wikipedia article is this reliable sources guideline. So WP colon RS for reliable sources is the shortcut. Uh, and when something is on a sister site like Wikisource, it doesn't really impact whether or not it's a reliable source. The thing about reliable sources is that it's it it the the, the important factor is the reputation and the editorial process of the original pro the publisher. So there are many, many things on Wikisource that have been, things have been published by many, many different uh, book publishers, newspaper publishers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the reputation and the editorial process of that original publisher is always going to be the thing that determines whether or not it's a good source for a Wikipedia article. So, um, the fact that it's on Wikisource is probably a good indication that it's uh, that it that it might be reliable, but uh, you always need to think about what is what is sort of the what are the credentials of that original publisher, and is that someone who's uh, who has authority in the field that you're writing the article about? Because that's really going to be the the lens through which other Wikipedians look at it. I also wanted to just loop back to what uh, what Jeanette was saying a little while ago. Jeanette, you were saying you had a little difficulty using the Etherpad site, and uh, it occurs to me that if if you're still having trouble, you can always um, if you have any links or notes that you want to put in there, why don't you just type them into the chat window here um, in the Blackboard Collaborate software and just request that someone else paste them into the Etherpad, and at least that way we can capture that information. All right, so let's see, who else do we have with us today? Is there uh, anyone else that's, uh, that has a, a project they're starting to take on that could share their thoughts about it? So I'm going to just, I'm going to, oh, uh, F.E. Proctor uh, doesn't have a mic set up. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so you're interested in one of the OER providers and notice that somebody else already chose it. Uh, chose Coursera, so you chose Udacity, okay. Um, haven't planned specific changes, but noticed that it hasn't been updated in about a year, which, yeah, so that's a, a good indication there's probably lots of opportunity because there's so much going on in the world of MOOCs and, uh, and online courses. So why don't I pull up the Udacity article? Um, and this is... Uh, so Udacity is let's just let's just read together since I'm not super familiar with Udacity uh, it's going to be a little easier for me too if we just read from the article. So it's a private educational organization founded by Sebastian Thrun, David Stevens, and Mike Sokolsky, offering massive online massive open online courses. Uh, so this so for anyone that's not kind of from the open education world, uh, massive open online courses or MOOCs are something that have been gaining a, a ton of attention in the last 
couple of years. Um, Coursera and edX are sort of the big uh, names out there, which are uh, projects of uh, I believe it's uh, I believe it's MIT and Harvard uh, are sort of the the starting points for each of those. Uh, and they're basically they're platforms for offering courses along the lines of what we're doing here, but on a much bigger scale and with the full uh, backing of a major university. So um, in a lot of cases, these are um, these are courses that are that students are taking for credit, but they're presenting them in an online format where other people can join in and take them for free. They they might not get uh, the full credit towards a degree that you would as a student, but but. Uh, anyone on the internet would have the uh, the ability to take the class and, and learn from it. So, Pete, if I could, um, if I could just um, make one uh, additional um, comment about MOOCs. Um, I, I've done a little research into that as well as part of working on the OER article, and I also subscribe to the Chronicle of Higher Education. And of course, MOOCs are all over that, um, but. It's actually become a bit of an umbrella term, as I'm sure you're probably aware. And there's actually um, this distinction, which is relevant to the Udacity article, um, in that we now refer to XMOOCs and CMOOCs. And the the XMOOC um, is this model where you where they are basically taking ex, an expert or a, a more traditional, you know. Um, top-down educational approach where you have an expert who's dumping knowledge into the classroom and they're now taking that um, and commodifying it um, and, and calling it a MOOC, um, but it, it's not truly uh, an open learning experience, whereas that's what a CMOOC would be, where it's much more interactive. And perhaps Jeanette could shed some light on her experience with that as well, but I just wanted to make that distinction between XMOOCs and CMOOCs. Yes, thanks for pointing that out. I've just uh, I've just pulled up the article on MOOCs, and I know this is something that has been discussed. I think if we look at the talk page, we'll see um, it's been discussed it a couple of times how to get this idea into the um, into the MOOC article. Uh, I'm not seeing that discussion right here, but this actually could be a good opportunity if someone wants to work on this article or wants to, or um, you know, F.E. Proctor, if you feel like working on this on the side uh, as you work on the Udacity article, I think there's there's really a, a, a good opportunity, kind of some low-hanging fruit to explain that distinction, which has certainly been discussed uh, in a fair amount of media between XMOOCs and CMOOCs. Uh, I think that could really be a good way to improve a, a pretty important and highly read article. Um, Jeanette, I think uh, Christine invited you to comment on this. I don't know if, if MOOCs are something that you've worked with directly, but if you have anything to add, please feel free. Uh, and so, so F. U. Proctor, I, I've, I've just I've come back to the Udacity article, uh, and I just I thought maybe we could all discuss, uh, feel free to, anyone, feel free to use your microphone or the chat window if you have ideas about this article. And I, I, I'm just going to start sort of observing some of the things that, that jump out to me quickly. I haven't read this article before, so this is really my first look at it. Um, but I think as similar to how I, I, uh, I, I pointed out in the first article that I demonstrated for the class, the first thing that jumps out is that it does have a pretty well-developed lead section. Uh, it's got three paragraphs, uh, a number of citations in it. So that's Usually, a sign of an article that has received a fair amount of attention. Um, it's, it's uh, as I've mentioned before, it's pretty common for articles to develop in a way where people add a lot of detailed information to the the sections further down, uh, but uh, but don't necessarily take the time to think about how to summarize that and present it. So, but one of the first things I would look at if I were going to work on this article is does that lead section truly summarize everything that's in these other sections of the article, um, sometimes even if it did at one point, if more detailed information has been added, sometimes it kind of falls out of date. So that can be a really useful thing uh, to do to improve an article is kind of bring things, you know, maybe maybe this certification section is something that's been added since the lead section was written. So you might want to add a couple of sentences about certification. Um, as we go down, I, I, it's, it's nice we've got a, a photo of one of the founders. Um, We've got a list of various courses. 
that have been offered through Udacity, which is which is nice, and I like how it's it's hidden here because that's the sort of thing that certain, some readers might be very interested to see this, and others might really just not care at all about the specifics. They're more interested in the platform, so it gives people the choice of whether or not they want to spend the time poking through that. Um, so yeah, to me this looks like a reasonably well-developed article. Uh, I'm just uh, going to sort of with without having read it, but I would I would guess that I would I would probably put this at least at C class, uh, and I'm kind of curious now to click on the talk page and see. Okay, so it's been rated start class, and that's that's really it. It, it could easily start class could easily be accurate, sort of depending on how comprehensive this is after a more after a closer read. Um, but there should be plenty of opportunity to bring this up to to C class uh, or even B class, um, just by just by bringing it up to date and making sure that it's well summarized and that anything that's sort of more technical in the article is uh, is easily understood by someone who doesn't have necessarily a background in education. So good choice. So I'm just. Catching up on the uh, on the chat window here, uh, so I see there's a little bit more discussion about the article structure. Stephen, do you want to jump in and and add to what I was saying there? Yeah, sure. So um, Pete, Pete has more experience, I guess, looking at assessment than I do. But uh, one one of the things that stood out to me was how flat the article was. If you look, all of the sections, courses, enrollment, certification, are are really kind of top level sections. There's not a lot of, of subsections underneath each topic. I see there's one subsection in the first section on course format. But usually I see sort of a, a history section that gives me some background on the topic, um, some discussion of what they actually do, and then maybe some, some outside discussion of, of them and how they relate to the, the broader field they're part of. I think maybe the awards section might discuss some of that, but those are different areas I, I would look at to improve knowing nothing about MOOCs or Udacity in particular. Just looking at the structure of the headings tells me a little bit about how deep the article goes into the topic. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, and and another, another good thing to do can be to look at similar articles. So uh, F.E. Proctor, when you brought this up, you mentioned that someone had already chosen Coursera. Well, it might be worthwhile to take a look at the Coursera article, um, and just see. And this, not not to say that, you know, we have, we have no reason to think that the structure of the Coursera article would be better or worse, but just to get some ideas. So here we have an article about kind of a similar entity, uh, but its top level headers are business model, courses, partners. So. Um, you know, maybe you look at that, and you, you might want to think about: Is would a business model section make sense for Udacity? Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. But it, it can be a useful way to sort of explore your thoughts about how you might structure an article, how you might approach it. Pete, I don't know if you want to wade into this or not, but um, uh, we've also had a little side discussion over here about advertising, quote unquote, um, on Wikipedia, and I, I, I'm aware that there are. Um, you know, there's increasing pressure coming to to bear on Wikipedia, and uh, it, you know, in terms of uh, allowing businesses to to have pages there, and you know, this kind of touches on the whole encyclopedic endeavor. But um, it comes to mind because um, uh, the the person I, I'm sorry, I forget which which student Effie Proctor. Um, if if you're going to work on this article, you might be prepared to actually. Um, hear from somebody representing Udacity <laughs> as, as you work on it. Uh, you mean you mean that someone representing Udacity might notice that, that he's working on it and have some thoughts about whether might might not like the direction that he's taking it because it doesn't fit their marketing plan or some, is that is that sort of what you're referring to or um yeah I I I, I, I don't want to be conspiratorial here. I just want to, to encourage them to to keep their eyes open and be aware that Udacity is very likely um, watching this page, um, not just for for editorial purposes, but that changes will be noticed and and you should keep that in mind while working on it. Yeah, and that can be uh, it's a, it's it's a really it's a really worthwhile thing to point out. So thank you for doing that. Um, it's 
this this is something that can 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 really be a very negative or a very positive experience. If um, you know, I've I've had times when I've been working on an article and gotten an email out of the blue that someone is just thrilled that I'm working on that article and maybe has a little tidbit of information that I hadn't found otherwise. And other times you'll get an, a, an email or something that that someone is just uh, you know, is, is, is irritated with what you're doing because they have a different idea of what the article should be. Um, if, if that sort of thing happens, it's, your, your guiding principle really should always be Wikipedia's policies and the main ones being uh, relevant to that, being the neutral point of view. Um, so I'm going to just pull these up. NPOC, so neutral point of view. Um, so this is when, when uh, when a company has an opinion about the article about them, uh, they're probably used to thinking about that in terms of their own point of view, what they, how they want to be perceived. And that doesn't always align with the way that reliable sources, uh, articles about the company have been written. So if, uh, you know, just, I'm, again, I don't know much about Udacity, but, um, but just supposing that it's received, uh, you know, maybe a, a fair amount of coverage where, uh, sources like the Chronicle of Higher Education or something like that uh, have raised questions about the viability of its business model or about how effective it is at education. That might be the sort of thing that the company doesn't really want to be a central feature of the Wikipedia article. But the goal of Wikipedia is to accurately reflect how something has been uh, represented by, uh, by the relevant media in that field. So. Uh, the Wikipedian take on that would be, well, if there have been a number of articles in sources like the Chronicle of Higher Education, then that becomes an important thing to include in the article about Udacity. So, um, and then, and then I guess the the uh, a related uh, issue uh, that can come up for, and I, I see there was something else in the chat window. I think one of our other students just. Uh, asked about whether it was okay to work on certain articles. If, if that question comes from, if, you, if you're working for uh, the company that you want to write an article about, uh, that's also going to go back to that conflict of interest question that we've discussed. Uh, it's not completely against the rules to do it, but it is, you are really inviting uh, a whole new layer of challenges in doing it. Uh, I, would, I would very strongly urge you to be very transparent uh, if you do choose to take something like that on. Uh, if you work for Udacity and you want to work on the article about Udacity, it's a good idea to uh, put a note on your user page that says that you work there and also leave a note on the article talk page. Um, and you, you have to be prepared uh, for the, the standard that people will hold you to is they might hold you to kind of even a higher standard than, than they would if you were working on something that you have no connection to, to that, that you really want to keep in mind what is, uh, what is neutral, what is factual. Uh, which might be very distinct from what your, you know, PR or marketing department would like you to put in there. In one sort of... So, I, thank you. Yep. Oh, I, I was just going to say one sort of related idea to think about is you can see the revision history, so you know the other people who are working on the article. And, and oftentimes, articles are not written by that diverse group of people. Um, there, there are even tools, Pete, if you look, there's one that says contributors uh, up near the top. It'll tell you like a list of all the people who are working on an article. Um, and we look here, we see that one user has made 32 edits on the page and most other users have made below 10. So, I mean, he might not have any other relation to Udacity or Coursera or any of the, the topics, but he might have an interest like you in, in the article as well. And it can be a very friendly thing to reach out to them and just leave a note on this talk page to kind of collaborate on the page together. Excellent point. Thank and if, if, if you're suspicious that someone from a company is is stealthily working on their own article without being forthcoming. There are, are tools to um, expose that as well. I think there's something called Wiki Watchdog, um, which lets you take the anonymous IP address um, that might be um, presented on the history page and uh, track it back to a domain name.
Yep, that's true. Um, there's when when uh, when that sort of thing comes up, uh, I would just say in my experience, I think people are usually tend to respond much better to just questions about whether they work somewhere. Uh, what what might look like someone trying to edit stealthily might just be someone making edits without even realizing that someone else would care whether they work there or not. Um, so I, I think it's it's sort of it's a good good moment to uh, to come back to another a different kind of uh, one of Wikipedia's core policies, which is assume good faith. Um, whenever you run into a situation where you think someone else is doing something wrong, it's really it's it's always a good idea to, to try to imagine what what might be the best explanation of what they're trying to do, the most uh, the most sort of benevolent uh, thing that they might be trying to do, because often that's the case. Um, and you know, in a case like that, if someone is making, if someone is sort of continually adding, uh, adding links back to the company's own website throughout the article, for example, they might not realize that there's anything wrong with that, and they might work there. Uh, but if you leave them a note that says, "Hi, it looks like uh, you know, you've, I, I see you've been adding a lot of links to the company's website, and I wonder, do you work there? And uh, you know, do you have a connection to the company? Do you realize that Wikipedia?" Has policies about external links. The answer might be no. I didn't. I had no idea that there were policies about that. But now that they know, they they might be very interested to learn more. But if you go at them, uh, accusing them of working for the company, you might get a very different kind of kind of reaction. Um, and that's. Yes, uh, I, I, I think it's absolutely sorry. true. And I think that's the that's the sort of thing. I I really hope that with this course. Uh, that this is the sort of thing that uh, that all of you can sort of start to get exposed to that that can be really difficult to learn. There are lots of things about Wikipedia that it's easy to teach yourself, um, but this is one that when you're learning through trial and error, uh, I've I've seen so many people um, end up in really frustrating arguments on Wikipedia that end and and sort of end up getting burnt out over things that you really don't have to. Um, I, I guess just uh, just to even, just to get into my my kind of personal story with Wikipedia for a moment. Um, in the first year or so that I was editing Wikipedia, I I well I was mostly interested in political articles. I was I was working on a lot of articles where there was really substantial disagreement about what should go into them and whether it was okay for people with different connections to various campaigns uh, to be working on the articles. And I just I really remember seeing a lot of editors that I had a lot of admiration for burn out and get frustrated and leave Wikipedia either for good or maybe they thought they were going to leave for good and then maybe eventually started to come back. Um, and I had to sort of sit down and think to myself, is that something that I'm willing to let happen? And I really wasn't. I wanted to, I, I felt like Wikipedia is an important thing in the world and I, I want to be involved with it. I don't, I don't ever want something to happen that makes me just throw up my hands and, and want to walk away from it. Um, so I, I, I would I would really advise you, especially if you find yourself getting into anything that is uh, that's controversial or where there are conflicts of interest that play either your own or someone else's, um, to kind of continually check in with yourself and and uh, you know when you when you think about jumping into an argument, give a, take a moment to think about, about whether that's an argument you really want to see through and whether you really feel like you have an opportunity to have an impact on it. And in many cases, you know, after a second thought, you might realize, well, you know, is the world going to end if I if I just kind of let this one go and focus on something else for a while? Maybe not. And maybe you just go off. And one one of my favorite things to do when when that comes up is just to find something to work on that I'm pretty confident no one's going to complain about, where there's just an opportunity to add a lot of information, uh, and anybody that notices it is just going to be happy that new things are coming, and it's not likely to to spark any kind of debate. So, anyway, that was a sort of a rant I wasn't expecting to get off on, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, Pete, it's also true that um, you, you can sort of look through the uh, the looking glass the other way and and realize that it's just a Wikipedia article, <laughs> too. You know, I mean, <laughs> exactly. Yep. So uh, I I think we have uh, several students here we haven't heard from. Uh, Tammy, I think I think I've had a couple of.
comments in here. So you were, oh, so Kemi, you were asking something about OCLC. Um, so Kemi, is there is there a, a question or an article that you'd like to talk about for a minute? Um, I see OCLC is just a, that's a source for maybe for the article you were working on. Uh, or let's see. O OCLC is the online computer library company. Right. And they, they provide, they manage the bibliographic data for much of the academic world. Um, and they have their own um, numbering system and mark system. And ISBN is really a, a whole different system that's used more for the selling and publishing of books. And, uh, she was asking whether she should use the the OCLC or preference the OCLC information over the ISBN information in her citations. And my advice was just I, that I try and put in as much information as I have, but um, that my impression is that um, ISBN is the less important from an academic perspective and that that might carry over into encyclopedic work. But I, I'm sure um, you might have some thoughts. Yeah, I'm actually too, not you... sure. Well, I don't know if these, if the common Wikipedia citation templates have a place for the OCLC number or not. I'm just. I, I see a template um, for, it, it's, it's like, a, it's an authoritative little like VIC or something that I see at the bottom of pages, but I'm not used to necessarily yes. seeing it in the, in the template. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so uh, th this is actually, so I've actually worked closely with uh, with OCLC. I help them um, recruit for and hire a Wikipedia in residence who's been working there for, I think, over a year now. Um, in full disclosure, my spouse just, works he, he for did this OCLC. very cool project. <laughs> oh, excellent. Uh, I didn't know that. So I'm going to just pull out this, uh, this is kind of a random name that pops into my head of someone I know has a Wikipedia article. Um, and so the Wikipedian in residence at, uh, at OCLC developed this really cool, we, we've had some question about bots on Wikipedia, so automated processes that will go through and add information to articles or take care of various administrative tasks. And this I think is a really cool example of this where he developed a bot that um, that takes every, it, it, it finds every biographical article, basically every article where, where Wikipedia considers someone notable enough to have a biographical article, there's probably an entry for that person in this, uh, in, in, in what's called an authority control database, which is sort of the, how uh, the world of libraries keeps track of people and, um, and kind of make sure that when one person is talking about Shakespeare that, and someone else is talking about Shakespeare that they're talking about the same person, uh, keeps all that information together. Uh, and even, even across, uh, if I understand it right, I think um, if Shakespeare were, for example, were a, uh, a character in a fictional play, uh, there, then there might be an entry for that as well. So you would have Shakespeare as an author and also Shakespeare as a character and be able to kind of link those concepts together. Wait, which he is so more and more. more. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so what this this bot does is it goes through and adds these links to Wikipedia biographies, uh, and also links to the VIAF authority control database, so that you can link from. So we just clicked on a link from Wikipedia, and it took us to this VIAF.org site, which now shows us the entries in all of these different databases for this person, Mark Hatfield, from the the, the article that we clicked from. So you see there's the Wikipedia entry, so we could link back to Wikipedia here. Uh, we could also link to these various, uh, I, I think this is like the, the French National Library or something like that. Here we have which the American flag is, uh, uh, what, what is this exactly, is the LC linked data service uh, of the Library of Congress. So. Um, yeah, so, so this is kind of both a, a, a neat illustration of what bots can do and also um, shows you kind of how Wikipedia can connect up with other information services like libraries. Oh, and I see we have a comment from Kemi. So you're working on 
article that has only two references, but they were not used citations. Ended adding the first difference. Um, okay, let me just click on that link. Okay, so here's a. I do not. I'm not going to even try to pronounce this word. If there's, if we have any Spanish speakers with microphones, please, <laughs> please feel free. So it looks like there's a fair amount of information in here, but yes, there's uh, there's only one inline reference, only one one footnote that specifically cites a certain sentence, and then there are two other more general references. So yes, this is a, an excellent opportunity to uh, add citations to the specific facts and uh, and flesh out an article that's already well on its way. Mokul Hete. Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was something like that, but I was a little nervous to try it myself. So, uh, so Cami, any further thoughts about what you might want to do on this? It's early in the process, so if you if you haven't gotten there yet, that's fine. I'm going to just click on the talk page and see if you or anyone else has. So we don't really have a whole lot going on in the talk page. We do have uh, a comment about the picture and uh, a comment about requiring a cure before it grinds anything. So, uh, and these are, I see these are from 2006 and 2008. So it's not really that uncommon with a, with a lightly trafficked article. Uh, often you will you know, find that the most recent article is common is years old. One thing you could do is link to the um, Wiktionary listing for it, and that might allow you to plug in a pronunciation key. An excellent thought. So Wiktionary is is, uh, is another sister project to Wikipedia. Um, one of the reasons I was a little hesitant to pronounce this is that uh, where a Wikipedia article will often have a pronunciation guide right at the beginning, uh, this one doesn't. So uh, Wiktionary is it's a similar address to Wikipedia. E N for English. Dot Wiktionary. Dot org. Uh, and I'm going to actually copy the name here. So I'm going to go to Wiktionary. I'm going to type it into the search box here and see if that comes up. So there it is. And here we do have a pronunci pronunciation guide. So just simply copying and pasting that into the Wikipedia article would probably be helpful. Pronunciation is really not my strong point. I know there are a lot of different systems for uh, for representing how something is pronounced. So you might find that there are some uh, specific standards of how it's done on Wikipedia. Uh, but just, I think, copying and pasting this in would be an excellent start. And then there's also, um, now that we know that there's a definition on Wiktionary, uh, there's another nice little thing we can do is to provide an easy link to that Wiktionary def definition. And to do that, there's typically I think it's in the see also section. So I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a edit section here. And right underneath see also, I'll put uh, two squiggly brackets. So this is a template that I'm pulling up. I'll type in Wiktionary. So Wiktionary is the name of the template, and this is something for providing a link to the Wiktionary site. And I'll put a vertical bar and paste in the title of the article. And unless I'm remembering wrong, it's been a little while since I've done this, I believe that will, I'm going to do a preview, and I believe that will make a nice little box. Yep, there we go. So on the right-hand side there, that box gives you an easy link to look up this word in Wiktionary. So that's a, uh, there, there's also a similar template. We looked at Wikisource before. So if uh, if you find something that has an entry in Wikisource, you can add a similar template to the article there as well. Anyway, I see we've come to the end of our hour. So uh, if you're interested in that and, and want me to expand on it more, feel free to ask on our class talk page. Uh, we can cover that in between classes. Um, but for now, I want to give some extra special thanks to Stephen for joining us on short notice today uh, and providing some interesting context on uh, his own experience 
experience was on Wikipedia and Wikisource, uh, and also Christine for stepping up and helping manage some of the logistics and talking about her experience in the last class. So thank you both. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. And we will see. You. Yes. Okay. And we'll see you on Tuesday, same time. Talk to you then.